Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to SR House. My name is Asad Lalji. For those who don't know us, we are Avid Learning, the cultural arm of the SR Group. We're a public programming platform. Uh, we've conducted over 1,100 programs across multiple formats like panel discussions, workshops, festivals, and others, and connected with over 130,000 individuals since we began in 2009. This year, we celebrate our 10 years of programming. We focus on the arts, applied visual and performing, literature, cultural heritage, and innovation. And our curatorial focus includes presenting targeted discussions, such as this one, symposiums, workshops, festivals, roundtables, and much more. Our vision is to invite more people into the conversation about the arts by deepening their multicultural learning experiences through sustained partnerships and by diversifying our programs through new spaces, formats, and approaches. In this light, we regularly collaborate with the consular presence in this maximum city who bring us visiting scholars, filmmakers, artists and authors. And tonight, we're delighted to partner once again with the Italian Embassy Cultural Center in Mumbai, with whom we've presented a number of unique and successful programs over the years, including our very successful opera season 2018 at the Royal Opera House. Tonight's discussion is the second and final event held in celebration of 500 years of Leonardo da Vinci, scientist, artist, philosopher, a leading historical figure whose legacy spans generations and cultures and is even relevant today. Earlier this week, we hosted an exclusive performance recreating the music of the Renaissance by Census Ensemble at the Royal Opera House. And tonight, we present a panel discussion that examines the influence and implication of Leonardo da Vinci's contribution to humanities and science. I would now like to invite Consul General of Italy in Mumbai, Stefania Costanza, to come and say a few words. Stefania. Good evening to all of you. My first words are a big thanks. Thank you so much, Asad, for having us. Thanks to Avid Learning and to Asa House for hosting this really distinguished conversation. I would like to thank each and one of the panelists that will tell us more about Leonardo da Vinci. 2019 is the 500th unit, uh, anniversary of the death of Leonardo da Vinci. This is why we're having huge celebration all over the world, organized by the Italian cultural centers, Italian consulates, Italian embassies all over the world. It is extremely relevant and I wanted to tell you that right now in Rome, the Italian ambassador to Delhi is talking about this program. Since they are all the ambassadors gathered today for the, their annual uh, meeting and Leonardo is, is one of the most important topics that we are going to, um, to talk about. Apart from that, what I would like to say is that Nothing could be more appropriate than Avid Learning for partnering and talking about Leonardo da Vinci. Because no one was a most, more avid learner than Leonardo da Vinci. He was a genius and the definition stands for someone who all over his life researched and tried to learn and try to understand, because at the end of the day, learning avidly, it is not just a matter of knowing or collecting more knowledge. It is a, a vehicle, it is a means to get to understand the reality around us. Yeah. <laughs> this is something I don't understand. <laughs> uh, um, to learn the world we live in, and so also approach our future. So what we think it is a privilege for us is Leonardo da Vinci meets in Italian from Vinci, who was a small, it is still a small village close to Florence in Tuscany, and that moment was um, the center, the epicenter for Renaissance, in that was re the rebirth, the second birth of the humankind, where the thoughts and the, the learning and the knowledge 
defeated the, what we call the obscure time of medieval time that still gave us wonderful and amazing things. But that was the triumph of human mind and of knowledge and again learning. So the privilege that we have is he was born in Italy, he was definitely Italian, he was absolutely a man of his time, but he belongs to all the human kind, to all of us. It's a common heritage that you have, that I have, and that we share. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much for giving the possibility to all of us to know more about that. And I really hope you will enjoy this evening. And once again, grazie mille, also for your friendship. So without further ado, Welcome to Leonardo da Vinci, the intersection of philosophy and science, presented by the Italian Embassy Cultural Center, Mumbai and Avid Learning. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our speakers on stage, author Ashish Jaiswal, <laughs> Director General, Nehru Science Center, Mumbai, Dr. Shiv Prasad Kenin, Member of New Acropolis School of Philosophy and a Managing Trustee of Swadesh Foundation, Zarina Skruwala. <laughs> and our moderator for the evening, co-founder and head of research at Live History India, Akshay Chahan. <laughs> for more about our esteemed panelists, please refer to the bio handouts that have been given to you. Now remember, remove your phones, put them on silent and start using them. Start posting, tagging, retagging. Our handle is at Avid Learning and hashtag is Learning Never Stops. Thank you. Over to you, Akshay, and look forward to a fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us on an extremely rainy and windy Mumbai evening. So, I mean, I, I hope uh, you know you'll uh, have a nice time with us. So, uh, to begin our uh, discussion. The Renaissance period was one of the most uh, interesting times in history. It was the time of curiosity, discovery, and learning, where geniuses pushed the boundaries of what a human mind was capable of. Now, the man who epitomized Renaissance ideas was Leonardo da Vinci. Combining arts and sciences, you know, he challenged the what is the current pop wisdom of the left brain versus the right brain, the analytical mind of a scientist versus a creative mind of an artist. I mean, he was an anatomist, a geologist, a botanist, and, and scientist, painter, sculptor, so many of these things in a single lifetime. Today we are marking 500 years of Leonardo da Vinci. Before we start our discussion, I just want to give a historic context uh, uh, of Leonardo, especially for us in India. When Leonardo da Vinci was born in 1492, just one year before that, the, uh, yeah, for, sorry, 1452, just one year before that, the Lodi dynasty had come to power in Delhi. We were, in Mumbai, we were still under the sultans of Gujarat, and the Vijayanagar empire was just beginning. When he died in 1519, Babur launched his first foray into India. The Portuguese had captured Goa and were eyeing Bombay, and Krishna Devaraya was ruling Vijayanagar. And at this time, there was a man in Florence who was talking about flying gliders, about mechanized robots, about underwater diving suits, and you know, studying heart, heart and all kind of the most extraordinary things. So this is the amazing legacy of that man. Now I am going to start this discussion by asking each one of the panelists, you know, what is your inspiration from Leonardo da Vinci and you know, which one of his works inspires you the most? Would you like to Hi, good evening everyone. Um, so I work in education and uh, when I uh, uh, looked at Leonardo da Vinci, uh, I'm always kind of reminded of these two strands which exist throughout human civilization 
of learning. There is one strand which is which promotes interdisciplinarity. Uh, whether you see ancient Rome, ancient Greece, even India, uh, where you are free and you're not bogged down by the demands of whether you are a scientist or an artist. So you, you're free and you, you read music, mathematics, arts, sciences. And it happened um, again during the period of Renaissance. <coughs> And that was the time of universal man. And I think that that's one strand which uh, is diminishing. And then there is another strand throughout history where we are told that we can't do uh, uh, anything more than what we can focus on. And whether it's the more my, minutely we go, the better specialist we are. And I think uh, current times is, 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 is definitely uh, considering a sort of, it considers a specialist who doesn't understand anything else. We are shy of saying that. Uh, so if in today's time Leonardo was, uh, and he would say that I have um, uh, painted Mona Lisa, and like I, I, I wrote him about uh, a very interesting thing about book. So like this, this was what he's writing to the Sultan that I, your faithful servant. Understand that it has been your intention to erect a bridge from Galata to Istanbul. So he is proposing and he signs it as an architect engineer, Leonardo da Vinci, not a painter. So he dares to send this proposal to the Sultan saying that here is a bridge which is probably the first arched bridge of the world and without any sort of uh, pillars. And he, he is daringly and very, very, uh, very easily saying that I can also design a bridge. Whereas today, if, if I am sort of uh, keen to sort of dissect a cadaver, I would probably be thrown out. But here he was who dissected cadavers, drew um, anatomical sketches, uh, designed bridges, so I think what fascinates me about him as, as an educationist is he was curious and he was allowed to be curious. He was born in that specific time of the history where he could do uh, without being ridiculed at and he was a sheer genius. So for me uh, uh, what fascinates about him is his dabbling into science and not arts because that's where most of the children are told that you're not good at mathematics, you are you know, not good at physics, chemistry. So uh, I want to, uh, like I am fascinated by evolutionary biology. So I want to be uh, someone who is not ridiculed at. And that's what I like about him the most, that he was free even as, in his scientific endeavors. So, uh, just a <coughs> quick uh, bit of uh, Fact. So when he uh, gave these plans to the Ottoman Sultan, it, they were rejected, saying that this bridge was is you know un, it can never be built across the Golden Horn in the in the Bosphorus. And I think it, it's like recently you know they they have uh, built the same design, the same bridge in Norway, and I think there is a proposal to now build it in uh, Istanbul as well. I mean, so great, uh, Zarina. So I was excited by the title of this talk, which is uh, The Intersection of Science and Philosophy. And uh, yeah, I come from New Acropolis. I study, I'm a student there, and I thought, oh, wonderful. What a lovely title. And uh, I mean, and, and, and to get so many of you to come for a talk that says Leonardo da Vinci, The Intersection of Science and Philosophy. and we don't think of uh, Leonardo as a philosopher, actually, because we think of him as a genius, as an artist, as a painter, as a uh, you know, he drew sketches, he was an inventor. But what do these have to do with philosophy? I mean, how, how does that make him a philosopher? And I think the key is to ask, really, what is philosophy? So what is philosophy? Does anyone want to suggest? Anyone want to answer? Any thoughts? Wisdom, did someone say? Yes, exactly. So, 
the etymology is two words, philos, which is love, yes, and sophia, which is wisdom. So philosophy is just simply the love of wisdom. And it was coined by Pythagoras, who we all know for his theorem, but he was a philosopher par excellence, you know, and was like considered to be a tremendously wise man in 6th century Greece. And these philosophers of 6th century Greece, incidentally, were the inspirations for the Renaissance, which will come to later. So he was a really wise man, and everyone said, oh, Pythagoras, this is the story. Okay, it's a story. I wasn't there, but it's a story. And they say, oh, Pythagoras, you are so, so wise, you know. You're so, so far, so far. He said, I'm not. I am not wise, but I love wisdom. So philosophy is a search, a search for wisdom. And in as much as it's a search for wisdom, there are many infinite routes to wisdom. You can think of uh, philosophy as a mountain. At the tip is wisdom, or mystery, or whatever you wish to call it. The, the what we seek, what we love, what we want to reach, what we want to be united with, is wisdom. And the root, the, the, the means are many, as infinite as climbing a mountain, infinite means. And for me, and for therefore, I, I would like to submit that yes, maybe Leonardo was a philosopher par excellence, maybe. He even said, painting is philosophy. So for him, painting was a means to search for wisdom. It was a, a way to search for this truth that he was seeking. Truth, beauty, wisdom, goodness, justice. I think that is what I love about him, this endless search. I mean, even towards the end of his life, it is so telling that he still carried with him the painting of his life, which you could say was the Mona Lisa, because he hadn't finished it. And this was a man who abandoned art, art, art uh, you know, uh, he kept abandoning his projects. He never finished most of his works. But something about the Mona Lisa was incomplete because he was still searching for the perfect painting. And it is my personal submission, and I think I read it somewhere also, that he was not satisfied with what he had found, with what he had, what he had, found, he had not yet found what he was looking for. And there's a, just to end this bit, he, he has a lovely quote, which I don't want to misquote, so I'm just going to read it with your permission. Um, he said, there are three classes of people. Those who see, those who see when they are shown, and those who do not see. So, to see what? To see truth, to see beauty. To see nature as a teacher, this is Leonardo, you know, which we can discuss later. And he was one of those who perhaps saw and also helped us to see. Dr. Kenneth, would you like to share? Um, well, uh, I'm from the science background. Um, unfortunately, I mean, as far as Leonardo da Vinci is concerned, um, artists have appropriated him more than the scientists or the engineers. I mean, when we look at, uh, think about uh, Da Vinci, we only, rightly so, think about uh, his monumental work, uh, Mona Lisa, or the Victorian uh, man there. Uh, but the best part of, as far as I'm concerned, what I'm thrilled about or what I'm inspired about uh, Da Vinci is his uh, unending quest to ask questions. If you really look at how we learn, the, the cognitive way of learning, the children, how do they learn? They start asking questions, why, what, how, things like that. It's only from the questions that you learn. But then the, the modern education system is such that after about maybe three, four years or so, right, from the parents to the teachers to everyone, they stop, they make children, they ensure that they don't ask questions. That's the, the, the best part of uh, Leonardo, what we need to learn from him is unending uh, question that he kept on asking to himself. Right from his childhood days, until his death. Why, what, how? This has always been his, uh, I mean, perhaps the, the best part of his contributions came from trying to understand why does the things work. For example, I mean, he was not a formally educated man. In, in fact, he never went to the, the schools. But then he talked about every possible subject. Uh, he talked about the engineering. In fact, um, one of the applications that he sent, so-called biodata, the CV that he sent, included 10 points, the last one was not a point, you know, the bulleted points. Each of these 10 points talked about the military engineering, talking about building bridges, building, building uh, tanks, um, 
trying to divert the river, mapping the city and things like that. The last one, in addition to all these things, I can also paint and I am fairly a good sculptor. Now that's what he, his own analysis of his strengths were not the art. It was more to do with the science and more to do with the engineering. That's the beauty of it. And then the, the another thing is even in his own painting, because of his unending curiosity, you will have a look at that, you will have an image of his uh, unending quest in each of his paintings. We talked about the Mona Lisa, the, the perfect smile that he wanted. He took maybe about 10 years to come out with this uh, painting. But then the, the light, the shadow, the optics, understanding each of this was perhaps key to his, uh, the perfect smile that he wanted. Even for example, the Virgin Mary that on the rocks, if you really look at that, uh, it's, yes, one can appreciate the, the painting point of view, but then if you just look at the background, you have a, uh, the cave there, then what he talks about is the geology that he has gone minutely, actually looked at the geological part of it. There's a stratigraphy. I mean, in the, in the Genesis, for example, you, 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 you ascribe a particular period of uh, the life or the universe, the, the whole uh, genesis of the life itself. But then he knows that if you look at the, the, the rocks, you will actually understand that the life existed millions of years ago. Life in different formats. He studied those rocks. If you look at the, the painting, the way he has described, minutely drawn these things, that clearly shows that everything that he did, it was not just an abstract painting from his mind. It was a mind thought, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. But then based on his own visualization and inferring what he actually looked at, asking questions, trying to find answers, that's what made him a great point. This is what inspires me because we basically as scientists, you know, one has to observe. Observation is central to understanding science. After observing, can we try to hypothesize something? Can we experiment something? Can we validate something? Once you validate, it becomes a, it becomes a law. So that's what is uh, something which, uh, which I like about uh, David. Uh, Dr. Kenny, the difficult question for you, so as a, as a man of science, I mean, which of his uh, inventions, his technological inventions, uh, you know, do you think is, it really surprises you, wows you, that 500 years ago he, because so many of it, like right from the parachute to the, the mechanical cart, I mean, quite recently in the last 20, 30 years, I mean, scientists have made models and a lot of things work, so which one of you just wows you? Which one of you wows you? You know, he had about 7,200 pages of his notebooks where he, you know, he extensively talks about different subjects. But then, there are several things that I like, but then one of the thing, one of the questions that he used to ask is, why is the sky blue? I like this because it somewhere, somewhere relates to our own scientist, C.V. Raman. You know, why is the sky blue won the Nobel Prize for uh, Lord Rayleigh, you know? The same question that Leonardo asked in, in 1450, I mean in the 15th century, um, Lord Rayleigh did ask this question and found an answer because that was the 20th century, early um, 19, late 19th and early 20th century. Same is the case. After Lord, F, or Lord Rayleigh found out that why the sky is blue because of the scattering of light, People still felt that the ocean is, the when Raman was traveling in the Mediterranean Sea and looked at the sea and then found, why is this uh, sea blue? Already there was an answer, Lord really had already found out that uh, the sky is blue. But then Raman really, Raman had the same characteristics, the same quality that uh, Leonardo had, perhaps he imbibed from him, asking questions. So he did ask questions and found that what Lord really has talked about it only pertains to the the sky, but not to the, the ocean. It's not the reflection that matters. Water molecules also scatter light. So this is where, you know, asking question is something what I like. You talked about the parachute. See, it is not merely drawing. The ornithopter that, you know, we talk, we talk about the flying machines or the screw, which we, you know, the modern helicopters are uh, the screw that he draw. He, I mean, it's a very famous uh, drawing that each one of us must have definitely seen it. But then, you know, much later, the Bernoulli's principle, you know, for example, I can actually demonstrate it here. If, if the, the, uh, the wind travel, the velocity of the wind is higher, than, uh, then what happens is that the pressure becomes lower, it tends to go up. So he had this concept, although he, there was no Bernoulli's principle, but he really understood the, 
dynamics, aerodynamics of this, and perhaps he drew that uh, the parachute, which was subsequently, much later, proved that it is still possible. You know, one of the most uh, extraordinary uh, things about uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, which, which I felt was that you know, I, ha I, have been, uh, I have been going through a lot of his notes, you know, which thankfully are available in English, and it, it was that he, he was not uh, educa educated in a formal sense in science, but he had these notes called codexes where he was writing every small detail, you know, right from the reflection of the light to the tongue of a woodpecker, and he would just look at the tongue of the woodpecker and think and analyze and, and those kind of things. So, I would like to ask that in, in today's time, when education and degrees and all are, are so important, I mean, how, how much of scope is there? I mean, Ashish, maybe, you know, since you study I mean, the work in the education field, how, how do you see uh, the formal training in education versus uh, discoveries through observation and all? And there are people, there will be people up today, you know, maybe observing, maybe making predictions. How, how much scope do they have? So I think that uh, whether you are in formal education or not, you, your uh, ability to observe and be curious uh, would take you further. So you can have a startup uh, run by a person who may not have gone through the formal route, but he would definitely uh, be able to. But so formalizing a curriculum uh, and versus someone who is very well read. Uh, across disciplines is probably similar for me uh, uh, because that guy may not have a degree in the end but he would uh, know the chronology of events, disciplines, uh, mathematics. So I think that uh, someone who doesn't have a degree but is well read is, is probably uh, more talented. Irony is that uh, right uh, in current context or current education when we are dividing disciplines, we are uh, taking children away from dabbling into the other side. So an uh, engineer may not end up reading uh, uh, even about Leonardo for that matter uh, and he can, he can top the exams. Uh, but what I have sort of found and, and uh, like uh, my research and the concept of fluidity is that Paradoxically, I feel that someone who is narrowing has more chance to be redundant in today's times uh, versus someone who expands, even within your field. So if you're a doctor who's very narrow versus someone who understands the, the various aspects of other disciplines, you may be a better doctor. So it's, it's, uh, it sounds very paradoxical, but I feel that when I, when I looked at fluidity, I found most of the geniuses were actually quite fluid. They were, like even Steve Jobs for that matter, he combined arts and sciences. Uh, I, I mean, C.V. Raman also uh, had extensive research on rhythm, uh, which not many of us are aware of, that he wrote a paper in Nature describing about the qualities of why rhythm is such a, such a beautiful and special instrument. Uh, so I think that uh, the more uh, I look into people like Leonardo da Vinci, uh, I see that they are very interdisciplinary. They, they they try to push the frontiers, and I think that's a sign of a genius. That you know you don't want to kind of say that I. And I mean, like many Nobel Prize winners, even like uh, 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 the person who sort of. Identify the DNA structure. Uh, yeah, so it was because of his background in physics, and uh, where he said that you know it was my background which I, I was able to identify. So I think I think that it all comes to the genius is the one who will bring all of it together, and perhaps an average person could just make a mess of it. But that's the root. I think that whether we are a genius or an average person uh, walking on different parts is the way to go, whether you're making a film or or uh, devising a piece uh, or, or, or writing lyrics or even for Leonardo he had understanding of anatomy and perspectives, lights and shadows and everything. 
So I think your mind will take you further, but the root is the various disciplines working on it. So I think from the education perspective, I think that's where we are lacking. So specifically uh, regarding Leonardo, do you think his lack of formal training in science helped him because it pushed the frontiers of his mind or else he would have been, uh, uh, you know, I mean, constrained by conventional learning? What do you think? No, I think that Leonardo, for me, was pretty much, very much trained. I mean, like, whether, I mean, he went to the great masters in terms of his, his schooling, you can see, when he was around 14, 15, he was, he went to the, to one of the best mathematicians in, uh, in uh, Florence. And I think that uh, he was formally trained, in a way, I mean, like not in the sense that we understand formal training today. But uh, uh, if yet, what I feel is that he was a sheer genius, and he um, brought a lot of his training and teaching uh, into what he created in the end. And I think that he was a true disciple of Julius. Uh, and and his, his, his uh, foray into uh, military devices and portable bridges was, I mean, that's my, my understanding, that because of the rediscovery of uh, this architecture, and he, 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 a lot of his ideas about, which go beyond uh, uh, painting, uh, and when you read this architecture by Vitruvius, you would see that he has gone into space designs and he was, was the father of architecture and he, he, his book is, uh, is, is probably one of the more, only surviving texts from that time. He, uh, um, apart from urban planning, wrote extensively on military and, and, and I think that with the rediscovery of uh, a, a renaissance, truly, I think that uh, Leonardo is, uh, is probably the true symbol because he defines the, the spirit of the universal man. Someone who can do probably everything. Uh, Dr. Kimmel, uh, how, how do you see it? The fact that, you know, I mean, uh, his, his training, you know, I mean, the lack of training in science and what, what he achieved. I mean, did it help him? Did it not? Oh, no, no, I mean, lack of training, why just in science in anything? I mean, it's uh, perhaps the, he himself, in his own words, he, um, this is one statement which perhaps will uh, let us know his mind. He says, you know, I'm fully conscious that not being a literary man, certain presumptuous persons will think that they may reasonably blame me, alleging that I'm not a, I'm not a man of letters. Foolish folks, he says. Do they not know that I might re retort as uh, Marius did to the Roman patricians by saying that, they who deck themselves out in the labor of others will not allow me my own. I mean, I hope you understand. I mean, the, what he says is that if you really look at what others have done, the formal, formal education or something like that, perhaps he's not going to have his own, create his own uh, standing. This is the statement that he makes. So he, perhaps he may not have had a formal uh, education, but then, you know, unfortunate part of uh, um, Leonardo, is that he was not able to publish. He really wanted to publish a treatise on uh, water. He actually had 15 chapters on uh, hydraulics. You know, the, uh, that's the reason if you really look at any of the paintings of uh, um, Da Vinci, Leonardo Da Vinci, that you will have those curly things. He was so fascinated, unendingly fascinated, and uh, perhaps that his curiosity for understanding why does this world say happen in the water, but, you know, just the the, hydrodynamics of the water, he had about 64 uh, names given to the, the kind of a pressure that water creates. Even in modern days, you don't have that many. So each of these, uh, the water circling, you know, if I keep a pen there, if I keep some, uh, some obstruction there, how does the water go? At each of the levels, what is the velocity with which the water flows? Every minute details he was actually observing and not just observing, he was experimenting. He was putting some kind of a leaves there at, at the top level, at the middle level, um, some seeds there to understand what, what velocity does the, the, these, each of these things flow and then jot, um, jotting it down in his uh, notebooks. Perhaps his, the, not just the observation, experimentation and then trying to arrive at some kind of a, kind of a hypothesis. This is what made him great. So, one, one of the things uh, I mean, which you touched about was the fact that because uh, his, his uh, 
manuscripts and all were never published. How much, how much of impact do you think it had on, on the uh, discoveries later on? Uh, see, Vesalius, for example, you know, any of the anatomy that uh, we know, everybody talks about Vesalius because he was the first man, he himself was um, a surgeon. Uh, so naturally, you know, he, he had a doctorate degree. So, plus, um, it was in his um, lineage as well. He came from the doctor's family. So he published uh, his findings on anatomy. But if you really look at the anatomical figures of uh, Da Vinci, which were not published, um, um, Vesalius comes about um, 60, 70 years later. Um, even today, if you look at the drawings of anatomical drawings of um, Leonardo Da Vinci and Vesalius, you find that uh, the, um, the anatomical aspect of it is equally fine in uh, Leonardo Da Vinci. And he used to dissect, you know, that was the time when uh, you're not supposed to dissect, dissect. More so, a person like him, he used to go and sit with the doctors. Um, he will, uh, there's an 80, 90 years man who actually he met him and then he says that uh, um, soon he died. He actually started dissecting him, at layer by layer, not just uh, dissecting when I say understanding. Them. If you really look at the heart, the drawings of the heart, there's a, I mean, um, how do the heart pump blood? How does it defy gravity? No, he went just not into the understanding of the, the, the movement of the, the blood through the veins and the arteries. Also, how does the, the iotas work in the heart? To this detail, So, uh, bringing uh, that topic to the nature, you know, I mean, a lot of what his inventions, you know, right, right from the gliders and all, were connected with nature. So Zarina, can you tell us, you know, how, how do you see his, his connection with uh, nature and how do you think nature inspired his works? So just before that, I'd like to answer the previous question. I think it's a very interesting question and really worth asking because it's very pertinent to our times. I think our education system. The good or bad news is that because Leonardo was illegitimate, he didn't go to the cathedral schools of the day. He wasn't allowed to join the guild of his father. His father was a notary, which is like a solicitor. He would have become a solicitor if he was legitimate. Can you imagine that? He would have gone to one of those schools. He was left-handed. He would have been made to be right-handed. He may have lost some of his creativity. He almost certainly would not have become an artist. So he went to the Abacus school. It was called the Abacus school, where I don't exactly know what he studied, but apparently Vasari was an historian. He used to said that his father used to grumble that all this boy does is draw, you know. So he went through his entire early school, drawing his way through school. And finally, a very fed up father brought him to Florence in, um, when he was 12. And he joined um, the workshop of a very well-known artist, who now we don't remember so much, Andre Verrocchio. And the point over here is that he really started learning now. So he was trained, not just, the point is, the training was not just in the arts. It was in optics, it was in engineering, it was in uh, biology, astronomy, um, uh, you know, every, uh, uh, how water flows, hydraulics. They studied everything. They discussed philosophy in those workshops of theirs. I mean, so the whole point of the Renaissance was he was a man of his times. He was a man, he was, the, he was the epitome of the Renaissance because the Renaissance believed in a comparative system of study. And that is the beauty of every golden age. Every golden age of man has a comparative because that, the search is for wisdom. And there are many, as I said before, I mean, I can keep saying it because there are many means. And you use your left brain or you use your right brain. We're human beings, we're, we're meant to use everything that we have, both our brains and the corpus calcium in between. So really to, to, to think of, to, I think the idea and the inspiration for us really should be to rethink how can we bring about a new renaissance? What are the ingredients, the inputs of a renaissance? And is it possible to move from our Kali Yuga, as we call it, to another renaissance? I mean, that is why the Middle Ages to the renaissance, that period, is a period of transition. It's so interesting for us to discuss and worth really thinking about and deliberating from all angles, from education, from the aspect of science and mathematics and beauty and art and music and dance and integrating all this. For example, there is a tremendous amount of mathematics in dance. I mean, not to do with 
But the, the, this is what they studied. And this is what every golden age studies. I mean, I, I, because, you know, the reason I'm asking is because we, we, it's, uh, it, it just seems that we are so disconnected from nature now so in our big urban cities. So. Okay, so, uh, sorry, please. No. Mm, how do you learn from nature? Uh, the proportions, the ratios, the divine ratio, what is called as a golden ratio, but then at that point of time, it is to be called as a divine ratio. There's a particular number, it's an irrational number. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Something known as the Fibonacci series. That Fibonacci series is like, for example, one, the way the rabbits uh, in a reproduce, you have one pair of rabbit, the next pair of rabbit, then the next one is going to be one, one, two, three, five, things like that. But the, in nature, two numbers in the Fibonacci series is something what decides that. When, when these two numbers are divided, the, high, the bigger number divided with the smaller number, it gives you a constant. Not a constant, it's an unending uh, number. That's called as the uh, phi, not pi. Pi is again an irrational number. You, the, the proportion is there in my finger, for example, this small little part, the next part, the next part, the next part. This also follow the, follows that uh, the value phi, 1.61 or things like that. So he observed this, the divine ratio or the golden ratio. He observed this and tried to follow this. If you really look at the way he was trying to measure the ratio of the face of the body so minutely, obsessively, it all reflected in his paintings. So, so uh, I mean, I think uh, nature is something that inspired him deeply. And um, he always said, I may not be quoting correctly, but he said nature is the greatest teacher. And it is that that Nature really holds all the secrets. So when you study it, it starts revealing. Are those secrets hidden from us? Is the Fibonacci series hidden from us? No. But we need to see it. Okay? And, and he saw it. And he brought it to us. So he studied nature like a crazy man. And he was crazy. He was crazy. You know? he, he used to lie on the grass for like days and draw minutely every piece of gra grass cloud formations and draw cloud formations. He drew the flow of water. He, he drew everything that he could possibly get his hands on. So nature was his greatest inspiration, his greatest teacher. And I'd just like to, I actually really, there's a quote, which I'm sorry, I just can't remember, so I have to read it. I don't want to misquote him, and it's quite special. She said, he said, nature is the source of all true knowledge. She has her own logic, her own laws talking about the laws of nature. Fibonacci series is one of those laws. She has no effect without cause. See how deep he is. See what he's saying. That everything has a purpose and a meaning and a reason. Yeah? No invention without necessity. Nature does not create for its own sake, but born out of the necessity of something. Life has a purpose. Life has laws. Life has meaning. And the whole point about nature that I want to end my bit with is that we always think of, you know, like nature and us. This is not right. We are a part of nature. We are nature. Nature is us too. You know, there was a concept in, in Greece which they all studied, they took inspiration from, called macrobios, which means big, one living being. The earth is one living being. The universe is one living being. And we are all little, little part of it. And we all have a role to play. And what happens when we don't play that role is a question we can ask ourselves. I would like to add a few lighter things. Uh, for instance, uh, if you are not completing your projects, you may be like Leonardo. If you procrastinate, you may be like Leonardo. If you leave things in the middle, you like Leonardo. Uh, if you are reading fashion magazines, maybe you are like Leonardo. Uh, he was very particular about how he looked. So, for instance, I was wearing, thinking of wearing black shoes today, but I thought that maybe uh, I should do something different. So he was uh, uh, inspiration from Leonardo. He uh, used to wear pink robes. Uh, and orange robes and design the robes for himself and used to attend these 
flashy parties and organize these parties. So I think uh, uh, what I feel is that when we are a uh, little uh, sh uh, shy from like, you know, whenever we are in a sort of an intellectual environment, even in the society or schools, colleges, uh, we are sort of told that, you know, no, these things are guilty pleasures and you can't uh, look in a certain way and be intellectual. Uh, so I think Leonardo sort of uh, tells us that you know you can have two shoes over sort of this formal coat or whatever. So I think uh, uh, style, fashion, uh, being happy and being able to uh, tell to the world that I'm not completing your project. I'm not living for you. I'm living for myself. So I think that is where probably Zarino will be able to tell more about the philosopher. But I think that uh, when we uh, can tell the world, uh, to the world, sorry, that yes, I'm living and I have to enjoy life and be happy about myself, I think that's the true purpose of wisdom and eventually that's the wise person in the end. So I think that that's what the lighter side of Leonardo is that you know he didn't complete many of his projects and I think good good for him and good for us. So you know the you know the privilege of not com completing projects and I, I really wish you know, all of us could have that. So, <laughs> but you know that that brings us to the point that one of the criticisms which was made of him was that you know he was a flake and he never completed his projects. And he also, you know, later in the life, you know, he, he raised, uh, you know, he uh, quest questioned himself that, you know, have I done enough or have I completed enough? So, so how, how do you think, uh, uh, looking back at his life and, and the fact that he never completed a lot of his works, so how, how do you see that aspect of his life? You know, you know, when I was doing the research, I, I read one thing that he said, and I, I don't have it written down, and my memory is not the best, but something to the lines that art is never completed, it is only abandoned. This is what he wrote. And I, and I agree with Ashi. I think it's great that he abandoned it when he could abandon it. And we need to follow what we believe to be right. And he always followed what he believed to be right. And he partied and he had a great time. He was really good looking and he had these gorgeous curly hair and wore pink robes and he was flamboyant and he was amazing, you know. So I think follow your dream, abandon what you, you think is not going to teach you. It's probably guessing from him, he had lost that thing that I will now learn from this. So when he stopped learning, I sense, I mean, I cannot say for sure, I can guess that he probably abandoned projects and he just got bored of them. Or he didn't think he was going anywhere with it and he wasn't learning anything. And the man was an avid learner. So maybe that, that could explain this. And I say bravo. Well, and another best part of it is he was not a conformist. The conformist is something, a comfort zone, which all of us would love to be in a comfort zone. Coming out of comfort zone is something which is extremely difficult. Um, I mean, psychologically, we enjoy being in a comfort zone. But he was always, never ever been in a comfort zone. And he was a gay, I mean, he was charged for sodomy, but then fortunately, um, nobody turned up to actually uh, give any evidence to him. And fortunately, the other gentleman who was charged with him had some connections. So he got away from that. I mean, what I'm trying to tell you is he was never a conformist. During that period, you know, some, someone having to be a gay or a sodomy charge is nothing but, you know, death. So he was never conformed. And um, trying to tell the world that, you know, the, much before uh, uh, what we call on the origin of species by Darwin, you know, which came about somewhere in the 18th century. Much before that, he actually talked about uh, the earth it is earth sage is much much larger than what the genesis says it's not that easy during his times so i have to ask you guys a non conformist guy who never completes his project would you would you hire him would you want to work him on your projects <laughs> see one of the reason why creativity don't thrive is you assign a target you assign what is to be done understanding nature for example uh, 
just one little, each one of us have our own mobiles and transistors and iPads and whatnot. They all come from one fundamental discovery of what's known as the discovery of a transistor for which three people won the Nobel Prize. Uh, the William Shockley is one of them. William Shockley is uh, perhaps the father of the Silicon Valley. Then, you know, the, the IC and things like that. Um, I'm coming back to your question. What is your question? What do you hire a doctor? Yeah, the reason, see, if, imagine if the Bell Laboratories had given a target that you know you will have to find out this at uh, the discovery of the transistor. Uh, I think uh, there were about a few, my few, I think a billion dollar invested in one small little transistor. If AT&T Bell Laboratory had thought about it that um, is it worth investing in? Perhaps uh, they would never have invested so much money. The fundamental science is something where you don't have uh, it's always a short-term goal that we think about. When you look at the lo longer-term goals, then perhaps we hire it. But each one of us have a myopic vision. So because of this myopic vision, perhaps, perhaps we may not have hired it. Sorry. You're asking something? Of course I will hire Ashish, you know, one of the criticisms thrown at him was that, you know, he, he was a jack of all. Now, in your book, The Fluid, you know, you propound the T theory. So, could, could you just uh, tell us about that? <coughs> that was the time. Uh, so, jack of all trade, uh, or master of all trade, perhaps, because uh, of his sheer ability, I think he was perhaps master of all trade. And uh, I think, I mean, I mentioned it here that jack of all trade was first used for Shakespeare. Uh, and uh, he was called up Star Crow, and <clears throat> so I think uh, probably uh, what I say is that when you have the freedom to abandon things and you sort of venture into all directions, I sort of in fluidity I say that, uh, and I invoke Bruce Lee in my book saying that. You know, Bruce Lee has very uh, beautifully defined uh, what fluidity is and he uh, says that, uh, you know, uh, be like water, that you know, when you put water into a cup it becomes the cup, when you put it in a teapot it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash, so be water my friend. So you have to flow but at the same time you have to converge. So I uh, take sort of, I've kind of given a fluid wheel example saying that when you converge, uh, when you venture out, look around, connect with nature and bring all that back to your project, to the fulcrum, I think that is where you become, uh, you produce something profound. So I think that's what I say in fluidity, that it's not only about being, so a uh, misinterpretation of Fluidity can be sometimes that uh, jack of all trade, or you know, we, and that's why you know sometimes we are uh, told by our parents and teachers, uh, not in the right sense, that don't venture out. You should venture out, but then you should, like uh, one uh, uh, thing which sort of when I was when I dabble, I sort of uh, when I was thinking of spirituality. So some, somebody asked me and I, and I, and I said that um, it's wise to walk on the path of spirituality but it's wiser to know when do you need to stop. So I think that's what it is that you know, venture out but come back. So you know, uh, you meet a lot of people and uh, you know, you have uh, ask them, you know, I mean, what, what are you interested in, you say, oh, you know, we dabble in a lot of things and all. So this dabbling versus specialization. Now, in case of Leonardo, do you think, in a in lot of people you see, where there is this one strain which is in which they are uh, specialists in and they excel in, in, in the other areas. So in, in the case of life of Leonardo da Vinci, do you think there was one thing which he was an absolute genius at? And there were others uh, which were add-ons, Dr. Kendall? Um, one thing that he was specialized in, for example, Michelangelo. You know, they had a little bit of a rivalry. Michelangelo is perhaps, everyone of us knows that he was uh, as famous or maybe 
um, as uh, Leonardo da Vinci in, in terms of his painting. But if you look at it, uh, look at the paintings of Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, the life that exists, the natural way that each of his paintings are. That's found only in uh, Leonardo da Vinci's painting, not even in Michelangelo. Now the best part of it is, you know, like I told you, he was never a conformist. The best example of not being a conformist, and you know, I just now told you that, um, would you have had, I would have been, like I told you, I would not have. I would have been as foolish as uh, um, Shockley. You know, Shockley started a company called as uh, Shockley Semiconductors in uh, Silicon Valley. Um, he hired the best, eight, most brilliant, most genius, uh, uh, all in the age of about 20, 25 to 28, 30 years, and then told them what to do not allowed them to be genius and then work on their own thing. They did tolerate him for some time, but then all the eight of them, ensemble, they deserted him. They are called as the treacherous eight. You can actually Google and then see the Silicon Valley that you see today in US, where they have freedom for innovation. It all started from these eight people. Two of them are uh, Gordon Moore and uh, Robert Noyce. These are the two people who actually founded Intel. So these Eight treacherous people, what William Shockley called as the treacherous eight, because he, they, they, he treated them as uh, traitors. Those people went on to start one company known as the Fairchild Semiconductors. You now, we just celebrated the 50 years of Moon's landing. The, most of the semiconductors that were used, they all came from Fairchild Semiconductor. So, not being conformist uh, and trying to be genius, trying to work, dabble in your own areas of interest is something which is very special to you. I want, uh, I want to ask you, now coming to his, one of his most famous works, The Vitruvian Man, how, how do you see his philosophical beliefs and The Vitruvian Man? Could you please tell us something about it? So it's an amazing painting, you know, there's a bit of it. Oh, uh, it's gone. Anyway, so I wish it was there because uh, I think you, you all remember The Vitruvian Man, right? So when you see it, what do you see? It's a man. His hands here and his legs are there. And his, he fits exactly into a circle. And there is the same man with his hands separately put. And he fits into a square. So big deal. <laughs> right? Not right. So there are two ways to look at this. There are many ways. I mean, you can go on, you can have a whole lecture on, or you can make it your life study also, the Vitruvian man. And it's fascinated, ever since it was drawn, it has fascinated humankind, right? There's something that pulls us. As always, there is more to it than meets the eye. The, the first is, he solved through this, uh, the circling of, ah, lovely, thank you, thank you, so I can refer to it now, you know, referring to it. But uh, he solved a mathematical problem, that's the first thing. But of course, since I'm talking about philosophy, he, he solved one of the ancient, the problems of the ancient world called squaring the circle, right? Uh, which is, how do you draw a circle. There's a circle with a particular area. How do you draw a square of the same area without using anything except a set square and a compass? And it was decided by the scientists. The scientists proposed it, but said it is unsolvable due to the nature of pi. Yes? Okay? You cannot solve. So it was one of the great unsolvable problems of the ancient times. For centuries it was unsolved, unsolved, unsolved. And then 20 years before the birth of Christ, a man called Vitruvius, who you referred to. He was a Roman engineer and architect. He wrote 10 books on architecture, or just Architectura, I don't know how to say it in Italian. The defining books on architecture, which Leonardo read. And he said, then, 20 years before the birth of Christ, that a perfectly proportioned man can fit both into a circle and a square. Hmm? And many, many, many people were inspired by these sentences and tried to figure out how to draw it. How do we draw it? How? But he never said how to draw it. He never drew it also. He just wrote these sentences. And then he wrote certain beautiful proportions, harmonious measurements. And he was written, and in Leonardo's painting, if you Google it, the up and down is those proportions that Vitruvius has written about the hand, this proportion, the proportion of the hand to the body, the proportion of the foot to the body, one seventh, one tenth, exactly he's written it. Vitruvius has written it. Leonardo drew that. Okay? And of course it's said that he drew his own body because he was really beautiful as well. But that's not really the point. The point is he drew that 
and he managed to circle the square. That is the first thing he did. But of course, we're talking about, is that enough? Is that all? Are we so excited because he circled the square? No, because there is a much deeper meaning to it. For centuries, the circle is a symbol of something, and the square is a symbol of something else. And can you guess a little bit what the circle? So the man who is standing like this, the center of the circle is his navel. And the man who is standing in the square, the center is his groin. This gives us a hint. But for centuries, the circle was seen as a symbol of divinity, of the formless, of truth, of beauty, of ideals. Um, what we call in India, arupa, that without form, yes? And the square was a symbol of matter, four directions, um, matter in, in its physical form. And in the human being, that matter took on the form of our personality, our body, our emotions, our mental, okay? And the Greeks had a very interesting word for it. They called it the personality comes from the word persona, which means mask. And Leonardo said, mask is equal to falsehood. And the sun, which is like the circle, represents truth. And if a man is standing within both a square and a circle, what does it mean actually? What is he trying to tell us? Why did he draw it? Why did he? he must have spent, I don't even know how much time drawing that one. Because he was trying to tell us, maybe, that we have a choice. We can either choose. Man has the ability to choose. And this is again Renaissance thought. Renaissance thought. That man has the ability to choose the higher or the lower, the circle or the square. And this is not, you know, it's not to dabble. It's not, it's, it's, it's about every decision we make in our life. To lie or not to lie. To tell a small little fib because, you know, or not to come late or to come on time, to be kind, to be generous or not. In every moment of our lives, we choose between the square and the circle. And that is what maybe he was trying to speak of. And he wrote about this. He wrote about the square, the circle, what it means, why he explored this painting. So, uh, Ashish, I want to ask you, this, this whole obsession with perfection. Now, in, in your book, you also make a bit interesting parallel with the types of man given in the Chitra Sutra of the Vishnu Dharmodha Purana uh, from the 7th century. So how, how do you see this, this uh, uh, the Leonardo's works with, you know, you have you've studied the stanzas of the Vishnu Dharmodha Purana, so... So, uh, uh, firstly, I mean, for me, I mean, and I may be completely wrong here, I think Vitruvian man, I always imagined him as a standing person, but while I was reading, and I can be wrong that he's actually lying on the floor. So that changed for me that there's a person lying on the floor within square and circle. So that's the first thing. Yeah. Because Vitruvius was trying to draw an architectural diagram. Right. He was actually trying to create cathedrals. Right. 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 So, uh, while I was uh, researching uh, Vitruvian Man, I stumbled upon this and this is probably my moment of glory in the book. I stumbled upon Vishnu Dharmotram Puranam, this ancient Indian text which is, uh, uh, which, which in one of its, and it's very similar to its, its uh, uh, chapters to Vitruvius' Des Architecture. It, it's, it's encyclopedic in nature in terms of it tells you uh, how to plant a tree, what should be the distance between two plants. And then in its third chapter, uh, which is called Chitra Sutra, it tells you how to draw and sketch. Uh, and incidentally, it tells you uh, about, uh, it's a dialogue between uh, Rishi Markande and King Vajra where uh, the king is asking that how uh, I t t tell me the principles of uh, making a good statue and Rishi Markande says that in order to make a good statue you first need to learn how to sketch 
So he says that, all right, give me the principles of sketching. He says, in order to learn to sketch, you need to first learn how uh, one dances. He said, all right, teach me how to dance. Then he says that in order to learn how to dance, you have to first learn the vocals and the padde and the gadde. So eventually, what that means is that knowledge is unified, integrated, and that's the whole nature of integrative learning. And it goes on in the immediate next two sort of pages about the proportions of a perfect man and uh, more so proportions of five perfect men, which in my book I, um, I've, it's called Hans Purush. So I've given like a comparative where, uh, I mean it's Hans Purush. So he gives proportion of five men. So like we can also qualify as perfect men, not only the taller ones. So, uh, so there's 108 fingers tall person, 106, and up to 96. So there are five perfect men, and incidentally, there, because uh, Vitruvian man is often um, also sort of sometimes uh, 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 criticized because it's a symbol of a man and not a woman. And uh, uh, in, in, in Vishnu Dharmotaram Puranam, it goes on to define five perfect women where, for instance, it says that the perfect women, Hans, uh, women will be, uh, her, her uh, uh, waist will be f four inches, oh sorry, four fingers, uh, uh, sort of thinner than perhaps the perfect men. So I was quite fascinated by, by this text. And then uh, uh, I probably was wondering that why no connection has been made between Vishnu Dharmotram Puranam and this architecture and uh, Leonardo. Uh, and so I just went on uh, uh, sort of mentioning it here that knowledge is, is, is probably circulatory. Now what distinguishes Leonardo is that uh, the proportions given in Vishnu Dharmatram Pranam, nobody has, has drawn based on those proportions, are not near perfection. And so is the proportions given by Vitruvius. They're not so near perfection. He gave 22 measurements and Leonardo only took half of them. He had then his own proportions, which then took him to uh, the Vitruvian man. So I think that uh, probably in the sort of antiquities, uh, you had people working on the proportions of human body and then when I realized that you know you can like that the, your your um, sort of face is 16 fingers or 8 fingers and your lips is one finger perfect man so probably people were working on it but nobody if there are people who attempted Vitruvius man drawing and it's not very good looking uh, uh, in, in sort of there are many people who attempted so when you see what Leonardo drew I think it's it's magnificent it's like he he, his proportions and the square and the circle, it's, it's, the, it's his sheer genius. So I think that's what distinguishes him. Uh, just not by merely giving proportions, he sort of gives his own proportion and creates this uh, remarkable piece of art and science. So, uh, I, I just had one query because you know when I was going through the stanzas uh, of uh, the Chitra Sutra, you know, one, one uh, difference which I, which I noticed from uh, Vitruvius and uh, Leonardo, I, mean, I could be wrong, and the Vishnu Dharmottha Puran, is that, you know, in, in the Puran, it is, that it is, a lot of it is connected with astrology, where it says that these five type of men, you know, if you're born in Venus, Mercury, so and so, would... Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so, Vishnu Dharmottha Puran. So, Chitra, so it's very, it's very encyclopedic. So, uh, it's not uh, like if you're born, I mean, not that I read. So I incidentally got hold of the original sort of shlokas and, uh, and it was pretty plain Jane in terms of uh, that, you know, uh, you know, giving through, like he, he uses, so Rishni, Rishi Markandi uses finger as probably his, his unit of measurement, whereas Vitruvius uses the face as the unit of measurement. So he doesn't talk about fingers, but the, the Vishnu, so they are probably, uh, um, you know, purely talking about the proportions. I have not come across whether it's astrology uh, into it. Uh, it's just the, the kind of men, perhaps, you know, 
stumped on and yeah. So uh, you know, coming to India today, you know, I mean, in this this mode of uh, getting into uh, technical degrees and uh, you know, I, I mean, this this strong divide between arts and sciences. I mean, once once we had the great polymaths, Homi Bhabha and uh, Shanti Swarup Patnagar and you know, all or C V so C V Raman, you know, who, who were great scientists but were also you know I think mean, grounded in arts and reading, literature, music. So now there is such a strong divide in the Indian education system today. So what can we learn you know from from the Leonardo's life and works? I mean, to create Leonardo's of today. But again, I mean, that was the period of Renaissance. So where you had freedom, luxury. Here, you know, it's such a demand versus supply. And I mean, we must understand this. For example, um, if you have to create something, your first basic needs the um, what we call that um, hierarchical needs of uh, Abra uh, Maslow's hierarchical needs. Only when you come up to the last stage, self-actualization stage, that's perhaps when you can actually create. But the basic things, Roti Kapra Makan and when you go up. So that's the time when everybody is rushing towards that. When you when you have, notwithstanding the number of uh, IITs here, so about 20 plus, that means you still have about only 10,000 seats. There are about 4 lakh uh, students aspiring to join them. Do they have time for this? Is it our own system that is to be faulted rather than the people, the students? But they still have a large number of people who are multifaceted. The ones who go to the IITs. You, you talked about Raman. He talked about uh, Vridangam and uh, he, he compared the Indian instruments with the, the Western instruments and studied the harmonics. When you, the paper that he published in Nature, you know, he studied the harmonics and said that the Indian percussion instruments are more pure in terms of uh, the sound they generate in, in comparison with, with, with the Western ones. Do you apologize to you, ma'am? <laughs> uh, so this is a multifaceted person that, you know, he actually thought of writing a paper on uh, musical instruments. He could write a paper on musical instruments because he was very passionate about music. Things will come, but not up to that stage. The students will be up after a certain stage when they are assured of a particular career, which will actually fetch them take them beyond uh, the, the, the basic needs of the Maslow's hierarchy. That's the time when they will start dabbling in other things. You talked about the, the Francis and Crick. You know, Francis Crick was a second class BSc physics man. I don't know if you are aware of that. He was a very ordinary physics man. But then he realized that that was physics was not his interest. He coined what is known as a gossip test. Very interesting thing. Each one of us gossip. He always used to gossip on biology, how does life function, what is brain and things like that. He decided much later, at, around, at the age of about 30 or so, 28 years or so, that physics is not his subject, where he has got a second class. So he, he joined uh, James Watson. That's where you get the Watson Crick model. At any stage, you can dabble into different uh, fields. He was a physicist, turned a biology, then he produced much more scholastic work than uh, James Watson. He was a PhD. In, in the environment. So let's be optimistic about it. I think, uh, yes, yes. So you know, we, we just, uh, I mean, uh, just before I come come to uh, the questions, I mean, I just wanted to say something about uh, Leonardo's art, you know, this is the Last Supper and uh, Mona Lisa, you know, I mean, after you go through his notes and look at his life and work, you never look at his paintings the same again, because they are a work of man grounded in science. I mean, Last Supper is all about perspectives. I mean, the amount of the study of light, you know, I mean, the six types of opaque light, and I mean, those kind of things, that's what makes Last Supper what it is. And the, the smile of Mona Lisa would not be uh, what it is had he not studied the anatomy of the muscles of the lower lip. I mean, that that's what makes it is. And, you know, before, before ending, uh, you know, like a pop trivia, uh, a story I just want to share. So there was a lady who, uh, in, in Florence's Uffizi Gallery who was looking at a painting uh, of Leonardo uh, da Vinci and her, that, that baby, you know, he kicked in the stomach. 
So she said, I'm going to name this child Leonardo. And that's how the Hollywood actor Leonardo DiCaprio was named. <laughs> Thank you. So questions, please? Yeah. Uh, it may sound foolish, but uh, would you say that uh, Leonardo was in the stage of the Turiya or was he even beyond that? The fourth stage? Of, of, of the meditation. Uh, uh, do you mean that he, he had connect he, at, at a metaphysical level? When you disconnect, you disconnect. Uh, out of the three stages, you come to the fourth, and that's just the beginning of your disconnection. So, yeah. no, I, I, I think, I mean, Swamiji at the Vedanta, I spoke to him and uh, Parthasarthi. I was fearing that because I have no more three stages, so. No, I spoke, sorry, I spoke to uh, Swami Parthasarthi and uh, because I was looking for a lot of answers and uh, actually out of nowhere, suddenly the artist in me came out and I didn't even know it was there. Name any style and I can do this. You know, I I think, and there is this one uh, school of thought that Leonardo and the people of his times were pretty materialistic. So they they uh, it was uh, it was a period after Black uh, uh, Plague, and we they it was the focus was men rather than God. And uh, we wanted to be like in the very moment of life and look at what a man could accomplish. So, that's See, Swami my... Swamiji, my question was that suddenly I am getting messages from the universe. So, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I mean, I don't think much research is done on it. So I think, you know, I mean, once, uh, once, I think that there needs to be more. Uh, you know. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, please. So actually that state, knowledge is revealed to you. So basically the traditional scientists. Traditional scientists or traditional artists think of what they want to do and then they do it. In the state that she's talking about, the real state, you actually go into a deep form of meditation, in a trance sort of, and knowledge is then you become a passage for divine knowledge. So, you know, so I, I, yeah, you but sort of come up with unconventional ideas, you put them on paper and then you say, oh gosh, I did this. That's, that's nothing that's exactly what you say. <laughs> the, next question, the next question, please. Good evening. I want to know, uh, did Davinci have any problem about the future or the near future or the distant future? Did he say like this is going to happen in the world or like did he make ever any proclamations? No, I, I think he was more grounded in science. So uh, I mean, uh, did did he see a world of science after after? No, I, I don't think that's like, what you talked about is you know forecasting something. I mean, I don't think he did that. I mean, he was always um, in reality. I mean, whatever he talked about, um, it, he really believed that it, it was possible. For example, the parachute that you talked about, the helicopter or the aeroplane that, you, you, that uh, his drawings are there, uh, he, he really believed that it's possible to fly. The best part of it is, you know, even right into the, up to the, I think, 1895, Lord Kelvin, who was the president of the Royal Society, the ultimate uh, intellectual scientist go on to be the, the fellow of the Royal Society and he was the president of the Royal Society. He said that it is humanly impossible for uh, heavier than air objects to fly. I'm talking about 1895. Eight years, an unlettered pair, the Wright brothers, proved him wrong. So, you know, you should look at him from that angle. What he thought perhaps may not have was, um, may not have had a scientific validation. But then he truly believed what he drew, that it's possible for uh, flying. It's just that it took another uh, 500 years, uh, 500, um, 400 plus years for uh, the flights to come in. So, uh, you know, uh, just, just to add to that, the fact that, you know, he was, he was a man of science and this is, 
you know, the, the 1500s where there were a lot of superstitious beliefs, but he observed and he tried to find an answer. He was observing the moon, he was observing the heart, he was ob observing the nature. He was observing and trying to get scientific answers through observation, isn't it? But I think it was also a factor of your science and evolution the and how flawless It was a lot of science. So science actually made sense, and I think it fed into each other. And you had Darwin. I mean, you had like you had Cop you know Copernicus and you know all these things. Later. Later. You take this other various sort of parts of the world. It was in the Middle Ages. No, another part of it. Reiki pointed out, Florence, for example, was uh, economically very strong, epicenter, and um, that was the time when Constantinople fell. So most of the Arab knowledge, which came from India, actually, the Arabs actually took a lot of knowledge from India, documented that. They, it all came to Florence. You know, um, Al Zibra, for example, Al Zebr. You know, from in his name, the Al Zibra, Al Khwarizmi, Al Gorithan. The, all these things, their works actually came from India. All these works from uh, once the, the Constantinople fell to the, the Ottoman Empire, they all migrated to Florence. Yes. Any, any more yeah. uh, so I was reading this book on him and I saw this uh, sort of page where all these animals were sort of laid out and it was almost implying that uh, he sort of inherently got evolution or natural selection and I was just wondering if any of you guys have any information on that. Like he did say that people, like uh, animals from different regions have uh, seemed to sort of have evolved differently and have, have different characteristics. So, uh, do you think you got this? This this very aspect, he has put it in one of his uh, very famous painting, um, uh, the Virgin Mary on the rocks. If you really look at that painting, he actually talks about this. Darwin talks about on the origin of species by natural selection, but perhaps he was not. Uh, you know, what you need in science is the exactitude of proof. You have to have it validated. Leonardo da Vinci did not have it validated, but he knew about uh, that. That's the reason when you look at the, the rocks, the stratification, the geological aspect of it, he really knew different uh, life species have evolved. But I would say that um, he predates the Darwin in terms of understanding the, the evolution. Yeah. I just want to say one thing that I want to be the the villain here, I want to break a little bit of myth around Leonardo. As a teacher, I want to sort of say to every learner, see, we are associating a lot of metaphysical ability to Darwin, oh sorry, to Leonardo. Uh, I think we are, yeah. So, uh, I think we are attributing a lot of mythical ability to Leonardo. Uh, we have to see him in the light of that he was a great brain with tremendous uh, conducive environment, ecosystem, and sort of this sort of renaissance around him. So I think as a learner, I mean, you don't have to be intimidated or attribute uh, by him or attribute him some special status as a learner. You, you, you can just say that, look, oh, he was a great mind who could probably read more than anyone else could, who could be more curious than anyone else, but his, but his instruments were uh, same. I don't think so that he sort of was high on something or he was metaphysical. I don't think so that he got the knowledge. He actually, uh, his quest was probably what got him. I, I totally agree with you because I don't think the point is that you just get something by some magic. You have to work for it. You know, it's a, it's a path of working, working, searching, looking, finding, working, 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 finding, finding, understanding, understanding everything. He said everything connects to everything else. So when he was studying optics, he was studying his painting, he was studying you know, anatomy and astronomy and everything connects to everything. But the whole point is, I think what, what one thing I would like to I would say, last thing I would like to say is, how do we bring it back? How do we bring this about? How does it... How can we have this conducive atmosphere that you were talking about 
And just one small suggestion, it's, it's like, what do we really value? What do we really want for our children? What do we really want for the world? What are the values that we want to bring back? And once we have those clearly stated in our minds, then we can bring art and beauty and science and polymaths to the world. But if we keep valuing, say, a job or material wealth or my bigger car or a bigger house, then we will be still constrained by the chains you know, that are kind of pulling us down. So we, we, we choose. It depends thanks. what we choose. Thanks, thanks, Zarina, so much for those perspectives. And you know, thank you, uh, panelists, for sharing uh, you know, such, such great fun. I, I thank you, audience. You know, I, I hope you have been enlightened by the life of this amazing man. Thank you to our panelists for this absorbing session. I mean, uh, and, and reiterating our hashtag that learning never stops. Uh, but uh, thank you, honestly. It was a very absorbing discussion. Thank you. Uh, uh, being here this evening and braving the rain. Uh, thank you to our partners, uh, the Italian Embassy Cultural Center in Mumbai for making this happen. Uh, we at Avid have a very busy next couple of weeks. We have over 10 programs in August, uh, so stay with us. Uh, for, uh, more information can be found uh, on flyers left outside there or on our social media. Uh, tomorrow we have a workshop on iPhone photography here by Iman Shusait. Next week we have a very interesting dance performance, uh, acrobatic performance, which we like to call it, at the Royal Opera House in Malcolm. Um, and many, many more. But thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of our journey that learning never stops. Have a good night.